We turn now in our study of 1 Peter to chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And in this first session, we will be focusing on the paradox that there is great rejoicing in the Christian life, even while we are being grieved by various trials. So, Father, as we take up this universal Christian experience that embattles us and causes us to wonder if it's even possible to live the Christian life at times because we are called to rejoice and we are grieved by so many difficulties. Grant this text to illumine that supernatural experience so that we can walk in it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go ahead and read the whole text. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In this you rejoice, namely what we saw before, that God in great mercy caused us to be born again. We have a living hope grounded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This living hope is in an objective inheritance that will never disappoint us because it's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and it will never fail to be there because it's kept for us. And we won't fail to get there because by God's power, we, we, you who are being guarded, we are being guarded through faith that will never fail for a salvation, namely this inheritance ready to be revealed in the last time in this you rejoice. So all those reasons to be full of rock-solid, unshakable hope brings us to rejoice. And as soon as he says this, he introduces the issue of various trials. But, but notice, this is not a command here. He just says, in this you rejoice. We don't get an imperative in First Peter until we get to verse 13, where we're commanded to hope fully. He's simply saying, you rejoice. This, this, I think, is probably very profound because this is the living Word of God, and the Word of God spoken often creates what it describes. So in simply saying to them, you are rejoicing in all of this, that may, by God's grace, through the Word, bring that about so that it's true as it is being said. Though now for a little while, what's that refer to? Life. Paul's, this slight momentary affliction is working for us in eternal weight of glory. This now is the now of this life. And it is a short life, even though through these trials it's going to feel long. And so he's reminding them it is short. It is now a little while. If necessary, whose necessity? God's necessity. How do we know that? Well, over in chapter 4, therefore let those who suffer according to God's will and trust their souls to a faithful creator. If God deems it necessary, why would he do that? We're going to see that in just a minute where 
our faith is found to result in praise and glory and honor. But for now, just know that Peter is not simply bringing up various trials that last for a lifetime called a little while that happen coincidentally or contingently or fortuitously or just randomly. This is if God deems it necessary and you are being grieved. There's no naivete here that these trials can be blown off and all there is is joy in the Christian life. There is grief in the Christian life. But notice, these are simultaneous. In this you are rejoicing, though you have been grieved. In the Greek, it's even more obvious that this grieving is not any particular moment in the past. These are people who are being grieved by various trials, and yet they are rejoicing like 2 Corinthians 6.10. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And those words there, rejoicing and sorrowful, are exactly the same words as grieved and rejoicing here. So we are often sorrowful and always rejoicing simultaneous. The human heart can do both at the same time. You've had experiences like that, probably. And then he uses this word various. It's not just one kind of trial that come. The fiery trials that come are of so many different kinds. Yet, we are rejoicing even though, even though we are being grieved by various trials. How can that be? How can joy keep on even though these various trials are coming? Well, it's because he gives us the reason why they come. Here's why they come. They come so that the tested genuineness, the genuineness of your faith may redound. I'm I'm leaving this out just for a moment so you don't fail to see how the sentence is structured. So that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But now let's take this parenthesis before we look at that more closely. This genuineness of faith is more precious than gold. And gold, even though it's perishable, unlike our faith, is tested by fire. And so if gold is tested by fire in order to get the impurities out of it, how much more will our faith be tested by the fiery trials so that it can be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of, at the revelation of Jesus Christ now who's who's praised glory and honor and surely the answer is yours because your faith is genuine you will be found praiseworthy and glorified and honored look at this this is Paul, I mean Peter, over in, in uh, chapter 4, verse 19. I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive, he's talking to the shepherds here, but it applies to all of us, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. That unfading right there is this word, right here, an inheritance that is unfading. Everybody gets this inheritance, and it is an unfading inheritance. There is an unfading crown of life and of righteousness, and it is called a crown of glory, and that glory is this glory right here. Your genuine faith will be found to result in praise and glory and honor. I mean, how can it be otherwise when the whole New Testament teaches, and Paul most explicitly, that if we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him? The glorification of the saints 
is a pervasive doctrine in the New Testament, and so it should not surprise us that when we are endowed with the very glory of Christ at the last day because of our tested genuineness of faith, there will be praise. It says in Romans twelve twenty nine, I mean 2, 29, that uh, our praise is not from man, but from God, and we will be honored. And that will not mean that we assume some kind of superior position to Christ because we are being praised and honored and glorified because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And what is faith in Jesus Christ? It is looking away from ourselves and our own sin and lack of desert and merit and saying, Christ is my all. Christ is my only hope. And that is what is praised. That is what is glorious. That is what is honored. 